So let's get started here with our second hour of uh, today's uh, event it will be a showcase of performance poetry. Um, beginning with our keynote performance poet, Kit Shell, expressed from the world premiere of his poetry jazz opera, Hard Knock Skin. Uh, now before I read uh, Kit's bio, I just want to say a little bit about Hard Knock Skin, his, uh, his poetry jazz opera. I was there at the premiere of Hard Knock Skin, and I found it to be an awesome and singular experience. Um, it's, it was all at once edgy and sharp-witted, exposing the scratchy side of life with lyrical realism and emotion. I highly recommend that you see it if it comes around again. So let me tell you a little bit about Kid. Uh, poet, playwright, founder of and former artistic director of Tantalus Theater Works, Kit Chell has always focused on the spoken and performance aspects of poetry. He has read from New York City to San Francisco and has generally hoboed around the world. His new jazz poetry opera, Hard Knock Skin, is currently being performed around town. Please attend one of the showings for some straight up, hard hitting performance poetry theater. Joining Kit on stage today is Michael Hess, a fellow poet and musician. So please give a warm welcome to Kit Shell and Michael Hess. Eugene and thank you Stephen. Thank you library. This is Michael Hess on Kit Shell. We've collaborated on a piece. We've each written our own parts and it's about a friend of ours named, well a guy we know named Micah and how things sometimes shake out. strained against the chains wrapped around his heart. He felt their weight before the boat had landed on that shore. Micah was at a crossroads, an intersection, a bypass, a toll booth of the soul. The mystery train of wise has been rode, just like the horse rode and put away wet and the road always comes to its end. Michael is at the end of his road, a dead end, a spiritual quandary, a Faustian bargain point. Micah didn't have to stay in the misery, but that proverbial part of self unrelentedly held on to the love of love. Michael was a romantic. He felt that love would win the day. Struggling with the rational and the emotional, he pitted the two foes together somewhere in the strings between the mind and the heart. He was foolish for thinking them separate in the first place. One, two, three, four. Time, oh, a sweet healing time. Pass these feelings on to the next Lovers willing to unlock Pandora's box. And there will always be more and more and more and more willing to take the plunge to leap into the lake. And Micah's chains slipped just enough to know that freedom was imminent and tears were sure to follow. Michael woke up to the usual voice in his head. How in the hell can I put all this shit together to have it work in my favor? Did Micah have to use so many cuss words? <laughs> of course he didn't have the answer. That would take a whole lot more denial and rationalizing in order to have a sense of control. Michael was the captain of his ship, the pilot, the oarsman, Karen himself. Micah was always wondering, waiting, wanting. Who, what, how, why, when. <laughs> Damn this a roller coaster up and down all around. When is the ride over? When are all these runaway thoughts? 
that's gonna pull into the station. Next stop, depression, guilt, remorse, self-recrimination. Well, what does it matter anyway? I'm stuck with being who I am today, despite my own self. The endless reflection pool of the self staring back from the deep, within the deep, within the deep, within the deep. As Micah moved through routine, the mirror caught his face just long enough to force him to see the reflection of his seeming self. That was okay. That was okay. He didn't mind his appearance today because today felt possible. He felt something different. Call it a glimpse of reality. Call it a hit of faith. Or maybe he just felt the love. Micah was a romantic after all. Micah awoke from a dream that wasn't his. Micah was waking up. This wasn't the first time that had occurred. He'd had their dreams before. They would come like thieves in the night, stealing his soul piece by piece in stealth. Michael wasn't concerned. He had plenty of soul left to survive with. Lots of fuel for the fire, kindling and petroleum, even kerosene. He'd met up with lots of bad company. It wouldn't be the first time he'd wrangled with demons or their like kind. Like Beelzebub, Abraxas, Decabria, Cassadia, Succubus. Micah focused in on the voices, listening for the little lies, the false pretenses, the absurd rational meanderings, not fooled by the fools. He'd had enough of all that noise in his head. Micah found the off switch. He'd known where it was all along, but where better to keep your enemies than occupying your own dreams? And what could be better than just turning them off, canceling the incessant Noise. Micah found peace in silence at long last. Micah found peace in silence at long last. Micah rested in the Dharma. Felt peace, blessed, the grand nothingness of everything. Rebuilt his soul with the light that follows darkness. But the universe would have none of that. It had found him on that winter's day, and he had begun to prepare himself. The truth had hunted him down well. Micah grabbed up an armload of wood and headed back to stoke the fire and start his day out, at the very least, with pain. We beseech the universe to bless Michael with peace, and all sentient creatures be blessed with peace too. Micah awoke to the winter's day. Looking out his window to the frost thick as thieves, in his heart he knew what had to be done. He had to face those demons like so many times before. Pick up the sword, follow the flag, do the work, fight the fight, take the hill. The last embers in the wood stove wouldn't get the coffee water to boil. So, with the reluctance of a man well past his years, he headed outside for firewood. As Micah crossed the yard, out of the corner of his eye, he saw the fox behind the fence post. Pretending not to see it, Michael went to the wood pile. But Micah knew that wood didn't matter anymore. The fox had shattered all the illusions. Micah knew. And somewhere a light shone, and somewhere a scar was healed, and somewhere a lover called out. Micah was cut to the quick. His soul lay bare. The tears streamed down his cheeks. The warm water melting the frost as they hit the ground. He turned back towards the fence, knowing that the fox was gone. 
knowing the dream had come and knowing that his time had come. Michael wanted to run. Michael wanted to hide behind those walls he had built to keep hell out. But the universe would have none of that. It had found him on that winter's day, and he began to prepare himself. The truth had hunted him down well. Micah grabbed up an armload of wood and headed back to stoke the fire and start his day out, at the very least, with pain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael. John LaBruce. Um, John LaBruce uncovered the Santa Claus lie when he was four years old. Football, as a training ground for future warriors and a complicit citizenry, was pretty clear to him before he hit high school. John went to OSU to be a mechanical engineer. He wanted to design new ways for human beings to interact with the physical world. He left OSU with an English degree and a passion for romantic poetry. After years of half-heartedly slogging poems off to literary journals and publishing occasionally, John found his niche in the Poetry Slam community. He's written for the stage, stumps, street corner ever since, howls, sings, urgently whispers words that question the ways we interact with the physical living world and the ways we hold each other. Please welcome John Lumbers. trustworthy junkie you've become. We've watched you bomb grandchildren and mothers to secure your oil fix. You taught us to do unto others. How do you explain this? You can't hide it any longer. The veins in your legs have collapsed from too many needles and you're HIV positive, impotent. America, your underwear is showing and the tracks and scabs on your once strong arms expose your addiction. Hands intended to hold the nation together are now limp and pale. Quickly raised in anger, fist shaking, threatening bodily harm. Loving hands turn terrorist. Your eyes are angry and dark. They used to inspire. America, you used to be a light, a fire for the world to follow through hard times. Now you lead us through landmines and improvised explosions. We trusted you with our children, our most valuable assets, which you proceeded to liquidate or freeze, educate them numb enough to believe that money, not food, grows on trees. Oh, America, listen to me. You need to be alarmed. You need to remember who you are, what it was you strove for. You need to house your homeless, feed your hungry. Remember the land of the free, home of the... Wake up, America! Don't fall asleep on me. You are a fixed-income elderly gentleman with health care and a place to sleep. You were born in an inner-city ghetto to a single meth-addicted mother, but you still believe in your possibility. America, you are no longer harassed in the workplace because of your tits and ass, and your pay is improving. America, what you have to say may infuriate or inspire. Either way, you're free to sing or shout or pray. America, it is your duty to show us the way. Justice, freedom, something to hope for. Don't leave us hungry, cold, and afraid while you wage your inner war. Can't you see that you have a problem? America, lay off your disease needles and your hypodermic oil well pipeline Jones. We promise you're not in this alone. Think methadone, oil alternatives, we'll bike to work, cut up our credit cards, eat food that's locally and organically grown. We promise we'll buy nothing that has to be driven, shipped, or flown from far reaches. We can do this. 
America, we love you, so we're giving you an ultimatum. This isn't a request, it's an intervention. Our lives are too intertwined for us to trust you any longer to your own facilities and devices. You have a disease, and it needs to be treated. America, we've changed our locks and we're not loaning you any more money. Not even late at night when your weeping grows to threats outside our doors. You need to commit to rehabilitation, revolutionary reform, or we start from scratch. Revolution by the people you're supposed to be for. So, uh, so, so now for something completely different. This is for Tim. This is called Fresh Browns. I baked you some brownies, baby. With dark chocolate chips, just the way you own, um, baby. Just the way you own, um, baby. Just the way you bake them, baby. Only I baked them, baby. Because I want to bake you brownies, baby. That's right. You heard me. I want to bake your brownies, baby. Then I want to get down on my hands and knees while you eat them, baby. And I want to, mmm. I want to scrub your floors, baby. On my hands and knees, scrubbing your floors with a little, mmm, my little elbow grease. I want to get every little bit of grime off your floors, baby. If it takes all night, baby, I'll go all night. Cleaning your floors on my hands and knees, baby. Mmm. So you can't take no more, baby. And then I'm gonna do your dishes, baby. <laughs> All of them. Brownie panda blender, baby. I'm gonna clean them up real good. Gonna make them bright and shiny, baby. Shiny like new money, baby. Oh, I'm gonna, gonna lick them clean, baby. Gonna lick all that dirty stuff off your dishes, baby. Gonna, oh. I'm gonna suck your spoons till they shine like moons in your pudding, baby. Oh, I love your spoons, baby. Gonna do your dishes, baby. Do all, all your luscious dishes. Have another brownie, baby. Just the way you make them, baby. Just the way you like them, baby. And excuse me while I dust your surfaces. When I take care of all your untouched inches, sugar, your bookshelves and lampshades, your picture frames and knickknacks. Oh. I'm gonna take care of all your cracks and crevices, baby. Get intimate with your hidden places, even if I have to move furniture and flower vases. Oh, I'll even whisk your windowsills with a feather duster. Yes, to the tears, you baby. Now stop your giggling, baby, because it's time to get serious. There's work to do, and I'm the man to do it. I'm your man, baby. Which is why I need to do your laundry, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, my hand, baby, like in the old days. I need to get my hands on your laundry, baby. Oh, and I'm going to start with the heavy stuff. Your jeans and t-shirts so I can treat it rough. But not too rough, baby. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm going to treat your laundry so sweet, baby, so loving like. And oh, by the time I get to the delicate stuff, your intimate pretties, baby. You're going to beg me to bring back some of that elbow grease into the job, baby. I'll be doing it so delicate like. Oh. That's right, baby, I'm gonna do your laundry. Until it's all done and neatly hung and folded and put away, baby. Right where you want it. Oh. And tomorrow night, baby, after the kids are in bed, I'm baking blueberry muffins and starting on scouring the showers. That's right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, the, the poetry slam thing is kind of a play around and have fun kind of thing. <laughs> um, and then there's also serious stuff. Okay. Two. How much? How much do we have time? You're good. Okay. Let's um. Uh, you know, so this this is an older poem that I wrote um, for my son. I'll start there. It's called "Be a Man." Come over here and deliver this baby, the doctor said, and she stepped aside. You were just a crown, a circle of hair emerging, and I was terrified to touch you. But you didn't wait for me to make up my mind. Your eyes were already in this world, so like those adrenaline pump moms who lift trains from pinned infants, I leaned in and held your head. 
freed your shoulders and you swam to me. You were too slippery to hold and too fragile for firm fingers. So I knelt and pulled you against my chest like a football catch. Evenings on the lawn when I was seven, Dad taught me how not to throw like a girl. Until my sternum hurt from hard spirals and my arm was rubber. Hours until I threw like a girl. You'll never beat your old man, he'd coach me locked in his half Nelson in third grade. Never cry, no matter how much it hurts. And he'd tighten his hold until I did. Third grade. That same year, he entered me in a wrestling match for kids. The gym was packed with fathers molding men from molehills. Sweating expectations. Don't win, Dad told me. Mean the guy. Hates him. I got my first job in high school. Comic books. Ask me anything about superheroes. My favorites were Spider-Man and Superman. Mild-mannered alter egos you don't want to fuck with. The way Peter Parker worshipped Mary Jane, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, I learned how to love your mother in comic books. How strong men need stronger women. How your weaknesses make you more real, more human. Minimum waged with a discount. It was hardly heroic, but at 16 it felt like x-ray vision and a cape. I mapped out an epic future filled with nothing but success. Even Superman would be impressed. When your big sister was born, uh, your mom worked. I turned down teaching jobs. I couldn't face a hundred kids a day knowing someone else would be holding mine, teaching her love, strength. Your grandmothers surprised me most with their expectations. Father, husband, worker bee, their kryptonite phone calls made me weak. I wanted to believe I was more than just a paycheck. I tried not to care, but there were too many important things that I wasn't doing. I was entitled to more than diapers and dishes. Love wasn't enough. I wanted to maim the guy. Hate him, her, your mother. I played along with your mom's pregnant taunts. It's a girl, she teased. You're outnumbered, it'll be fun. Three menstrual banshees to one. <laughs> Truth was, my greatest fear was how to raise a son. Holding you that afternoon, I was the one delivered. I bathed and swaddled you, you barely cried. When I gave you back to your mother, you knew exactly what to do with a boob. Now you're three. How could I have known that you would raise me? That you'd wear caped blue pajamas and insist on wrestling nightly? That you'd beat me every time? My son. My little son. So I'm a middle school teacher. I teach at Ridgeline Montessori here in town. I teach seven day great uh, blended classroom. I'm with the kids all day. Um, I just had graduation ceremony for my eighth graders that I've been with for two years now. On Thursday night, it was a pretty moving experience with this huge, gorgeous ceremony that we planned out. Uh, what made it extra special for me was my daughter uh, was in the eighth grade graduating class. Uh, she's been in my class for the last two years. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, I have 30 kids in the class, and it's a pretty remarkable experience to be able to spend all day. I, I was thinking about just in terms of my own life as a young adult as in middle school. Nobody, nobody spends that much time with an adult, with a single adult, one adult all day long, every day, ever uh, at, at that age. Um, we calculated it was about six to 7,000 hours, somewhere in there, that I've spent with these kids in the last two years. It was, uh, my dad was one. So this is, uh, you know, turned off fair play. I, I wrote one for her as well. This one took a lot longer, I think. It's called Write the Stars. It's no accident we peer into bigger the better black boxes filled with colorful pixels of light and call the movie stars. TV stars. Since before there was time, there were stars. And they told our stories. Night would fall and we'd gather around the small fire that was our primeval living room. And the sky was the biggest TV mankind will ever see. Natural 4D, space and time stretching out to infinity. And huddled close together, we charted our heroes' stories and constellations for future generations to point to, like channels in the sky, to remember. 
The stars told farmers when to plant and harvest. They told stories of hardship and struggle, of triumph and salvation. The information cataloged in the stars plotted a map in our collective consciousness that helped us navigate centuries of darkness and uncertainty. Unlike television, whose shows only run a couple seasons before they fade into obscurity, the myths of our ancestors are still written in the very same stars we see in the sky today. Our heroes were bold and brave, and our women... Let's cut to the chase. Our women were raped. They were taken, beaten, they were sacrificed in almost every constellation story. Stories still written in our stars like permission. When my daughter was in second grade, we stayed up late on a school night to watch the total lunar eclipse together in the backyard. When the moon was mostly blocked by the Earth's shadow, she asked me, why don't you have a real job like the other dads? It took eight years for the question to rise, and I remember looking up at the way the Earth had stepped in front of the moon, obscuring her completely. Bright, full moon commanding attention, and everyone's watching, but only waiting for the Earth to make an appearance. And when the Earth's bit is finished, everyone goes back inside to sleep, leaving the moon up there all alone, diminished. It's the eclipse they came out to see. The hero show. Something clicked. I picked out the stars and named my first constellation that night. Tasha, after my partner. Mother, lover, justice warrior, and sketched for my daughter the story we're still living. It's a story about the moon, how our mom is it, and I am too, depending on your perspective. And sometimes eclipses happen, and, and you should say sorry when they do. It's a story about the sun, our children, who we two revolve around, each of us, sometimes earth, sometimes moon, moving and moved, interdependent, full of light and shadow, but whole and flawed. These are the kinds of stories we need, where the hero's traits are blurred across gender, the way the Milky Way looks like a wash of light sometimes, making it impossible to pinpoint individual stars. I named the constellation to remind me what heroism is. It's her, and it's me, and sometimes it's both of us at once, and the only beast that needs to be defeated is our egos. After the eclipse, I pointed out Tasha's stars to my daughter so she could find, them, find her when she needs her. And that patch of stars over there, I told her, that's you. And I sketched a map of both of them inside the front cover of her journal. That's the constellation where you're writing your stories. We need new heroes, I told her, like you. And we snuggled under the blanket to watch the full moon's slow procession across the sky until it slipped behind the trees before we went inside to sleep. Cascadia, which he told you about earlier, the annual anthology of winning poems 
from the Oregon Student Poetry Contest, sponsored by the Oregon Poetry Association. He has four published books of his own and a blog on his website, www.wordsongs.com. So, Stephen, it's been another real adventure working with you, and come up and share. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, so, is everybody having a good time? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch hats here. <laughs> I must say, these are going to be a couple of hard acts to follow. Um, so, I'll try. Um, I would like to start off today by doing uh, three love poems. Uh, first one is from my new book, Black Tights. There's some erotic poetry in here. I'm not going to be reading that. <laughs> Ever since we've met, I've had this strong urge to eat strawberries. Fresh, nourishing, effervescent. Each kiss like a snowflake's unique pattern floating softly in the air, then landing. Each a small but integral part of a soft, white, fluffy feather bed. Each but a small patch in the quilt becoming our life together. One full of days, fresh for picking strawberries. You are still blossoming on the vine. Mm. And uh, from my chapbook, Wild Weed. Oh, to see the potential of who you are inside. What a flower, what a rose. What a fragrance it could be to see the colors of you sparkle, shine, drip all over like a wet rainbow. The layers of the coats could keep you warm forever and could beat the hours of time and the rustiness out of my breath. And this one, the last one, uh, is a love lament called Terry. Lemons on the tree that cause no one to pucker sit rotting in the rain on stormy Sunday. Well-worn flip-flops still carry your tired feet as you move slowly through your no-one-to-speak-to world. Vague, infrequent memories of making love you would rather just be touched in all the aching places, much kinder and safer than the risk of another breaking heart, long worn, like a thick, tarry robe, but without the comfort or warmth or the ability to soak up the wetness of your lonely tears. And now I would like to do a few poems from my newest book, SOS, Songs of Sobriety, A Personal Journey of Recovery. Um, I've been working on this book for a long time, uh, over 20 years, and it's very important to me, um, as I hope it may be of help and inspiration to others in their life struggles. It is basically a journey or a journal of the first 10 years of recovery in verse. Um, I am a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. I have over 25 years of sobriety now. And it was a struggle to stay in recovery, to be sure. Um, there, are, there are many stages you go through um, in the struggle. And three of the most important ones to me are desperation, hope, and resolution. Desperation uh, is that stage you go through before you get into recovery. Uh, that stage where you feel isolated, totally alone in the world, yet you cannot quite reach out your hand for help. And then hope is that stage where you are new in, in the recovery process, where you are observing and it looks like it is working for other people. And you hope it might work for you. And then resolution is the stage when you've been in recovery for a while and it feels like it's working for you. Your life is getting better 
and you feel like you've established a strong foundation in your recovery. So I'd like to do uh, something from the desperation stage last because it's going to be part of my performance piece. And so I'm going to do a couple here. Uh, the first one is from the hope stage. And this is called Modern Miracles. Modern Miracles walk through meeting halls, grateful to be alive. Sparkling eyes sent forth to each other for help and comfort in times of trouble. Modern Miracles brought together by a common problem, bonded by a common belief. Modern Miracles bringing hope through faith and spirit. Society's children shaken and stirred, once bereaved, now we grieve, live and breathe, modern miracles. And uh, from the resolution stage, this is called Arms of the Present. I am by no means the judge, don't wish to be the jury, I just want to lie here in your arms. I am no longer angry or full of fury. I am simply bedazzled by your charms. Just lying here in the arms of the present, no longer in the past. <laughs> trying to learn from each new moment. Trying to make it last. I am not longing to touch tomorrow. I smell the sense of today. I know that tomorrow will be taken care of, for someone is leading the way. Just lying here in the arms of the present, no longer in the past. Trying to learn from each new moment, trying to make it last. And one more from the resolution stage. Uh, this is titled, You and I. It is you who gives me gifts, lays opportunities in front of me. It is I must use those gifts, take action when the opportunities arise. It is you molds my destiny, gives me a reason to be here. It is I must have the courage to choose my path on this journey. It is you who is the creator of all there is to be pondered, decided. It is I must make decisions and causes to believe in and work for. You give me the free will to choose. I must make responsible choices. And uh, for the last two, I'm going to sit and do a little performance. from the desperation stage. Picture a hopeless drug addict, isolated in his loneliness, sitting in a chair, staring out the window, dreaming about a world he cannot participate in, wishing he could find a way out, crying in his lonely desperation. This is called Chair Dreams. Sitting in my chair, staring out my window, dreaming about all the things I'm going to do and see and be. You're going to love me, and it's going to be the best love ever. I could just get out of this chair and get it together. Chair dreams take me here and there. Chair dreams take me everywhere. Chair dreams seem so crystal clear for a moment. But then they're gone again. It's just another chair dream.
I know I was going to have a hit song in a house in the country, sit in a rocker on my front porch with endless inspiration. I know I was going to paint my masterpiece and write a prize-winning novel, and I remember it sometimes when I'm high enough. But I just can't seem to get out of this chair, can't seem to get motivated to go anywhere, and my dream slips away to the back of my mind till another day when the right combination finds my chair dreams. Chair dreams take me here and there. Chair dreams take me everywhere. Chair dreams seem so crystal clear for a moment. But then they're gone again. It's just another chair dream. Sitting in my chair, staring out the window, dreaming about all the things I'm gonna be. You're gonna love me. It's gonna be the best love ever. If I could just get out of this chair and get it together. But chair dreams take me here and there. My chair dreams, they take me everywhere. My chair dreams seems so crystal clear for a moment. But then they're gone again. It's just another chair dream. Yes, chair dreams take me here and there. Chair dreams take me everywhere. Chair dreams take me out of here. Chair dreams seem so crystal clear for a moment, but then I'm gone again. It's just another self-published over 20 years ago, when self-publishing was in its infancy. Um, I'd like to do this, this uh, poem in honor of the current struggle for gun control in our country, and to honor those families of the Newtown victims who are so courageously putting their grief on public display to facilitate and lobby for reasonable changes in our laws. I wrote this poem back in the 60s, right after my first son was born. The Vietnam War was in full force. Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. And gun control legislation was in the forefront of politics, just as it is today. Also, uh, when I was still living in Los Angeles, I used to read this poem every year on the anniversary of John Lennon's death at the candlelight vigil held at his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. This is my anti-war and anti-gun poem from 1969, Little Toy Gun. I gave you my name, and you gave me a son. He's starting to walk, I can't wait till he'll run. We'll ride him on ponies, he'll have lots of fun. But don't ever give him a little toy gun. He'll go around shooting you, me, and a friend. But it won't be a toy gun he'll use in the end. He'll find him a real one in the armed forces. I don't want my son taking mass murder courses. So buy him creative things, not for an impression. Let him develop his own self-expression. Expression is freedom, but don't get me wrong. I may not be free yet, but I'm getting strong. Understanding of my own hang-ups. I need understanding so I can be free. And then when our son needs someone to confide in, he always can come to you, babe, or to me. 
Yes, I gave you my name, and you gave me a son. He's starting to walk. I can't wait till he'll run. We'll ride him on ponies. He'll have lots of fun. But don't ever give him a little toy gun.